And when you build on the idea of consumption as a source of credit, you have the theory of discount. Now, this is very controversial because some people, like Ludwig von Mises, does not recognize this as a theory in its own right. He would say this is just a sub uh, chapter under this heading because discount is just a different way of calculating and paying interest. When you sell a bill, then immediately you take out of the proceeds, say this is a bill for $100, you take out the interest and you give less than $100, less by the uh, calculated on the deal. So that, uh, you call it a discount if the interest is paid in advance. But normally when you raise a loan, interest is paid at the end of the loan period. So he says that's a technical or even trivial distinction and there is no such a thing. And in fact, Mises never mentions consumption as a uh, uh, source of credit, and his followers uh, are very dogmatic about that because uh, they dismiss this lock, stock, and barrel, this part of credit theory. And you recognize the handiwork of Adam Smith here because the real bill is all involved, the real bill's doctrine in here. So of course the followers of Mises will excommunicate you if you try to spread that theory. And they say, no, no, everything is interesting. Now even within that there is controversy because the theory of interest is that part of economics which is most controversial to this day. It has not been the result to the satisfaction of the majority. There are factions, lots of them, a the whole spectrum of opinions and uh, budding theories, and uh, there is even serious infight. I just mentioned the most uh, the, uh, the most uh, vehement uh, infight. And that's actually very unfortunate because the, both schools represent uh, high quality economists, good people, and so on. And it's a fratricidal war, I would call it. There is the school of Time preference school, call it. Time preference school of interest. And there is the productivity. Productivity uh, school. of interest. And we will have opportunity to talk about this in more detail. I'll just give you the outlines. And they are diametrically opposite views. And Mises belongs to the time preference school. Uh, and he's very, very dogmatic about it. He would even call this complete nonsense. And I'm of the opinion that this was a mistake. And I think he made the mistake uh, because he, he was too committed to the quantity theory of money. Uh, if he had a little bit of open mind, he would have admitted the validity of, at least, 
the right to exist, there is justification for this. But unfortunately, it was very dogmatic about that. So as a consequence, his followers today would dismiss this as nonsense too. Not only this, but also this, which is part of the theory of interest. So let me go back to the uh, analogy I explained in the first hour of the river emptying into the ocean. And there is a cutoff there, uh, invisible, but it's there, the salinity of the water as you approach the ocean. You can measure the amount of salt. It was fresh water before, no salt, whatever. And then all of a sudden, like quantum jump, it becomes uh, visible. And this means disappearance of risk, almost complete disappearance of risk. Producers normally, producers, distributors, etc., work with risks. They don't know what the market will be able to take. They don't know what prices uh, which they can get, but they have to pay prices for the input right now, so there's a risk, may not be able to come. Their profit may uh, go up in smoke. So this risk, all of a sudden, if not completely, but the large part disappears when this cutoff point is reached. And uh, uh, it becomes a foregone conclusion that the maturing good will be sold to the ultimate consumer. Because the demand is there, and we know it's a short space of time, uh, 91 days, but call it because that's the length of the seasons and the seasonal nature of consumer goods uh, comes into play. The uh, type of goods in the greatest demand change with the season. Just think of the fact that people eat different food in winter from food they eat in summer and they wear different at least in our uh, climate, there are other climates as well, but let's just talk about our situation here in uh, Europe and in North America, Northern Hemisphere, uh, we have uh, seasons and the type of goods demanded most urgently will vary with the seasons. And for that reason, uh, we have uh, um, a change in the type of goods which we are talking about, maturing goods reaching the consumer. Now, I'm going to use a term which I borrowed from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And the term is social circulating capital. With uh, due respect to Adam Smith. Now, it's customary to distinguish between fixed capital and circulating capital for every enterprise which deals in goods, production or distribution of goods. Fixed capital is the buildings and tools, and circulating capital is the goods which go through the production or distribution process. And what Adam Smith is talking about is the mass of all goods which are close enough to the consumer so that 
it can be taken for granted that the goods will be removed by the ultimate consumer. So that's exactly this salinity part of the river emptying into the ocean, which Adam Smith would call the social circulating capital. And uh, it has to be within 91 days that this at the utmost that the good will reach the consumer. So that's why I like my analogy, this uh, river emptying into the ocean and the salinity, because it makes the uh, concept very vivid, and you can see that something like that must happen in the uh, economy as well. There is a change. There is a reduction in risk and increase in probability that the good will be sold. So that's physical. This just like the river and the water in the river and the salinity in the river, uh, the flow of goods to the market is physical. But corresponding to that physical entity, the mass of goods close enough to the consumer, but still in the production or distribution stage, there's a corresponding flow in the opposite direction and that's the financing. And this is credit. And this is not based on savings. It's based on the fact that we know that the goods will be consumed. So that these goods have a, well, let's use the word liquidity. Or drastically increased marketability in comparison with the upstream, which is much less marketable. It's marketable, but a very small market. The, the only people interested in is the next uh, producer who is handling that uh, semi-finished good. But up down river, downstream here, we have something which is very marketable, very much more marketable than upstream. It's closer to the consumer and this gold coin, which this will be exchanged. So here is the flow in the opposite direction of financing the movement of the underlying good. It's the real bill. It's the bill of exchange uh, maturing in not more than 91 days and it has, it's a substitute for cash. And in fact, nobody in that food chain will use gold to pay for the semi-finished good which changes hand from one producer to the next, still some distance away from the consumer. They won't. There is not enough gold to cover that uh, need for payments. So they finance this with this. And that's the second source of credit, consumption. So this is what we have to go into, dig a little bit deeper um, during the rest of this course. And I thought this is a very important idea. And I hope that this uh, analogy of the river emptying into the ocean which I brought into circulation and uh, I, I just found it very help, helpful and when I talked about this topic elsewhere I found that the audience uh, uh, also found it helpful so I hope this is the uh, case here also, but we'll see from the discussion. So with this I finish, but uh, before we take your questions, I'd like to go back and ask Keith. Now remember I was talking about the, the government, what was it? Uh, yes, the contradiction of 
the contradiction between the need for uh, money on the one hand and the need to reduce the government deficit. And uh, I am uh, obliged to, uh, I'm grateful to Keith, who yesterday showed me something on the internet, and it's called Treffin's, Treffin's Dilemma. So I'm asking Keith to say something about Treffin's, Treffin, what was the first name of Treffin? Robert. I think Robert, yeah. Robert Treffin, a monetary scientist in in the United States. I think he was actually Belgian. Belgian originally? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so Triffin did his work in the 1960s when the world was still on the Bretton Woods Agreement where at the end of World War II the United States told the, you know, everybody who had been beaten down by the war the new standard is going to be the dollar. You're going to treat the dollar as your reserve, as if it were gold, and hold it in your central banks. And we will, of course, be happy to oblige you by issuing the dollar. So in the 1960s, this was before the gold default of, of Nixon, Triffin realized that there was an interesting contradiction, which is that the world wanted two things simultaneously that were mutually opposed, and there's no resolution to this. The world wanted liquidity, which means more dollars, which means the U.S. was obliged to run a trade deficit as well as a government budget deficit, I believe, to continue to generate more and more of this debt-based negative value money so the world could have its liquidity. The world wanted the dollar to be strong. Uh, that's, on one hand, they wanted more liquidity. On the other hand, they want the dollar to be strong because they're keeping their accounts in lira, in pounds, in marks, in francs, or whatever, and they want the value of that dollar in their central bank to be a rock-solid thing as the United States continues to debase the currency so they can have more liquidity, but they want the dollar to be strong so that they have this mercantilist notion of everybody exports in order to get rich. And so there's no resolution to this. The dollar cannot simultaneously be strong so that the U.S. can buy up all the rest of the world's exports and simultaneously continue the debasement on this yeah, was, You cannot have your cake. Right. Eating. Right. And so the, there is no balancing mechanism the way there was under gold. The whole thing is unstable. And I think if Schreffen lived long enough to see 1971, he probably would have said, I told you so. Could you apply Schreffen's argument to the present situation when uh, the United States at least in public says that we are going to reduce the government debt, we are going to reduce the deficit. On the other hand, uh, we say that we have to have more uh, money because otherwise we have deflation and depression and unemployment and the rest of it. That's what's happening right now. The propaganda, right? right? That we have these two demands, but nobody points out the contradiction which Triffin saw half a century ago. So, could you come on, comment on that? I, I think you just said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the United States it says, you know, the, the so called strong dollar policy, which basically means we're going to print it as fast as we can get away with it. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, if I keep reading the articles on Zero Head, there are all these mini liquidity crises and trying to borrow, borrow dollars even in Europe and, and other places too. And so that, that demand for that increased liquidity is still there. And so, you know, this, this is one, another one of those things that will work until it doesn't. Thank you very much, Keith. So please, uh, I invite comments first on this one and then on anything having to do with our uh, lecture. Well, I hope everybody sees the dilemma, which is more than a dilemma, it's really a very serious contradiction, which means that the policies based on the idea of having your cake and eat it is not going to work ultimately. It may, you may have intermediate victories and results and successes, but ultimately it's doomed because there's an inner contradiction, you see, between 
strong dollar and the weak dollar. In fact, it's now announced policy. Bernanke announced it that he is going to print more and more and more as much as it takes to beat back unemployment and deflation and this and that. He takes it very seriously. Now the question is, at one point, he loses control completely. But there is a contradiction. And nobody is talking about it. That's frightening. That's really frightening. And somebody as long ago as half a century pointed this out. But it's all forgotten. They don't no longer talk about Treffin's dilemma. So open the floor to the uh, question. Do we have, not only on that, but on what Professor was talking about earlier? Okay. I've got a question. Oh, okay. oh, no, 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 no. No, no, because mine is actually a little bit open to what's being discussed. Okay. So if you have a more pertinent question, please go. I was only going to ask it because nobody else had a question. Okay, no, 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 go on. Go on. <laughs> My question very quickly is, and you've just touched upon it and reminded me, but it's not to do with what you've been talking about particularly. But I've asked you for the last, probably the last three times that I've been to the seminars, and you've always given me an answer, and I just wondered whether the answer was the same. You touched upon just then, uh, uh, basically, until it will no longer work. What is your prediction for when it will, for how much longer we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, look, I consider myself a scientist, and you have to understand that scientifically, it's not possible I do today. So, with that uh, remark, I'm willing to tell you what my opinion is, but it's just an opinion. It's, it's not more than that. I am one of those who believe that this is a deflationary situation, or if you want to put it that way, it's deflation first and hyperinflation later. Deflation now maybe depression now, and hyperinflation, the type happened in Weimar, Germany in 1920, 1923. The type happened in Zimbabwe more recently, type happened in Hungary in 1947. In the French Revolution, 1790, whatever, 95, I'll sing out Manda. That is not imminent. Now, a very large school of thought out there says that it's imminent. It's going to happen within months. So I'm not part of that. And if you want me to be more precise, I'm more reluctant to answer, but this is such a nice group. <laughs> 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 I am I'm willing to share my thought with you. I think it's further than most people think. And it may be further than what I think. I would still stick to my guns about not more than uh, five years. But not less than five not years. Not, uh, probably not more either. But so, um, why do I say that? I think because the bag of tricks which the government and the central bank has is an infinitely deep bag. And lots and lots of tricks uh, are still there, some of which you, nobody has any ideas. They just come in. Remember, uh, the first there was futures markets, fine granted. But then there was options on futures. And then there was options on options. And there were, was options on options on options. There are fancy words and knock, knock in swaps and, swaps and knock in yeah. uh, puts and knock out calls. And yeah. in infi I mean th this was not invented by government. Mm -hmm. This was invented by the uh, market, so to speak, which 
was bred artificially by government policy, but the, now the government is paying economists to think up tricks, new tricks. I mentioned one earlier that in Hungary they called it Pengu and then started knocking off zeros, well that's old hat, it's uh, happened in Zimbabwe, it happened in France also, and um, so on. But then, in Hungary, they called it Pengu, the unit, and then they changed it to tax Pengu. It's, it has the security that the government will always accept it from you in payment of taxes. So, for a few months, this kept its value, and this was fine, and then all of a sudden it started falling, just like the original penguin. So the government dreamed up a scheme. You had to buy a stamp, lick it, stick it on the on the pango, tax pango, and then it had some value. Without the stamp, it had zero value. So they thought this was good. And it, and it did work for a few months again. And then exactly the same thing happened and started losing value. So who knows? Maybe the next thing will be you have to stick a stamp on the stamp. <laughs> and then another stamp on the two stamps. And so we don't know. But there are all kinds of tricks. That's one reason why I think that it will take longer. Because there are all kinds of tricks they will come up with. And there is another reason which has to do with inertia and also the fact that an enormous amount of money is sloshing around the world. Dollars. And, and, uh, dollar-denominated, rather liquid uh, assets, just like treasury bills, which is not money, but it's almost a good substitute uh, for money, for dollars, and better even, because it pays a bit, bit of interest. Very, a large, large quantity of this is full. Then count uh, uh, some stocks which are very, very mar highly marketable, very liquid. And that's sloshing around. Now, once you wipe out the dollar's value, then you are wiping out not just the dollar's value, but everything else denominated in dollars. And that's too much for the human mind to digest. People are not... So they, there's inertia, because people can't believe that this can happen, and this is happening. They just can't. So they keep accepting dollars and dollar-denominated liquid assets, and uh, maybe the stock market is overripe for collapse today. But it's not collapsing, it's still going up because people have belief in their beliefs and confidence. So it just keeps going and going and going until some little spark, little disaster here or there, maybe a train crash or airline uh, crash or something unexpected will make people come to see the light that really the emperor is naked. We don't know. But I am willing to say that if you are making predictions, probably you are underestimating the uh, longevity of the dollar because it has more uh, Dynamics keep will, which will keep the game of musical chairs going. I'm sorry, I, I, that's the way I see it. If I'm wrong, I will be the first to admit it. I, I, I go more further. I would say that 
It is quite possible that this year there will be some cataclysmic event and it looks very much that the dollar is finished. And all of a sudden, like a phoenix, it will rise from its ashes and come back and people say, after all, we were right because the dollar, you know, I, I, I am that kind of a mind because even if the dollar drops 50% in value, purchasing power or in terms of the gold price or oil price, whatever, even if that happens within a very short space of time, I am going to say the game is not over until it's over and it's not over yet. In, in spite of the 50% loss, or more, 60%, then jump back, come back. And uh, that's, that's how I see it. But Thank this, you, is this is speculation. This is not science, you know. <laughs> we don't have a scientific way of... And nobody does. Just like we don't see the future. in 1871 or something, that there is the higher ask price and the lower bid price. And they never ever coincide, or let's say hardly ever, really never, because those would be very exceptional when the two coins. They can vary, the trade can take place at one or the other, but normally if you buy, you have to pay the ask price, and normally if you sell, you have to uh, be satisfied with the bid price. And he was talking about commodities. But now let's talk about financial instruments, which Menger didn't. And I asked myself the same theory, is it valid for financial instruments? And there is no reason why it would be any different. Where, where you buy and sell, there will be two prices. And so a bond also has an ask price and has a bid price. But you see, the price of bond is just the reciprocal of the rate of interest. So as a consequence, the, there are two, there's not no monolithic rate of interest. There is a floor and there is a ceiling for the rate of interest. So the floor corresponds to the ask price of the bond because that's reciprocal and the ceiling corresponds to the uh, bid price. 
So I came to that conclusion, thanks to Menger, and then I asked the question about if there are two rates of interest, the ceiling and the floor, then the next question is what is going to determine the ceiling and what is going to determine the floor? And since these two vary independently of one another, there are restrictions because they cannot turn around, obviously. A ceiling cannot be replaced by the floor and vice versa. But if one changes, there's no reason why the other should change at the same time. Sometimes they do. But it is also possible to for the two to get closer, in other words, the spread gets narrower, or the spread gets wider. So obviously there are two for sets of forces working, in, at work here. And you have to analyze them. And then I came to the conclusion, this was like, uh, you know, Saul, the later St. Paul struck, with the lightning on the way to Damascus, that's sure. One is determined by time preference, the other is productivity. And everything fell into place, like a jigsaw puzzle, when you have enough pieces in place, then the rest is easy. And this is, this is the answer to your question. <laughs> that uh, I, I think that the, there is a solution to that problem, and this is it. And this is what, uh, this is the job, my <coughs> mission to spread the word, that, uh, you know, uh, to, and uh, you, in order to understand time preference, well, this is where gold comes in, because uh, gold is a present good. And, a promise to pay gold is a future good. And that's another uh, place where I disagree with Mises. Mises says that, uh, that uh, paper money is a present good, period. If it's a gold certificate, it's a present good because it is exchangeable for gold without any hassle. But even if it's an irredeemable banknote, it's a present good because you can go out and buy, uh, buy uh, real goods as long as you can. But you see, if you accept this, then after all, Keynes was right. And Keynes said that uh, the government has the power of increasing the stock of purchasing media to turn stone into bread and water into wine. So what makes us different from the Keynesians? And another thing is, the government has to take such a perfectly useful good as a piece of paper and sprinkle a little bit of ink on it and bingo, it's wealth. You can go out, now we are thinking of paper money, we can go out and buy goods, real goods for that. So create wealth out of nothing by sprinkling a little bit of ink on a piece of paper. And of course Mises himself ridiculed this idea. But if, you, if Mises says that uh, irredeemable paper money is a present good, then basically he agrees that there is such a thing of turning the stone into bread. So anyhow, what I'm saying is that we, there's no reason to dilute the concept of a present good, because that's what Mises does. I mean, 
it's a promise to exchange the paper for present goods, for gold in particular. This is the most typical example. The government uh, gives you paper money and it's a promise to pay gold on demand to bearer. That's what paper money, uh, that's how paper money came into existence. And uh, that's a promise. But promise is not present good because you've got to go through that process of buying. And remember, there is lots of slips between cut and lip. So there is no need to dilute the concept of present good by admitting that paper money is a present good. It's a future good. Maybe high quality, maybe low quality, but it's never the same as a present good. Okay. So now here it is. You have gold. Okay? That's unquestionably a present good. And then you have a bond, a gold bond which is payable into gold at maturity. That's clearly a future good. So then there is an arbitrage going on between gold, the gold market, and the gold bond market. If you like the rate of interest, you'll take the gold bond. If you don't, then you get out of the gold bond and go to gold. That's arbitrage. You buy and sell at the same time. You see? And this arbitrage determines the level of not the rate of interest because there's no such thing as a monolithic, but it's the floor. Okay? And a similar argument goes for the productivity, but we'll discuss that later. Okay? Excellent. Excellent. Any any more questions, Rudy? I just like to add a little comment. With a present good, the invisible vacuum cleaner cannot work. Mm. It can't take half the gold coin out of your pocket invisibly, mm. but it can certainly take half the value of your paper out of your pocket invisibly. So that only works for future good. I promise. I just want to add a comment also. The professor has an essay on professorfactor.com uh, talking about the, the arbitrage between the um, marginal saver and the low interest rate will sell the bond to buy the gold, and the marginal entrepreneur, uh, if, he's, if he's earning lots of return on capital than the bond, he might as well look at his capital to buy the bond. That was the thing that clicked in my head and said, this is the seminal thinker in economics. <laughs> that's, that's what made me come to some of the tie the first time. Saying there's something here, and nobody else is saying this. Nobody, but I'm not. Thank you. Uh, so, the, the, the other arbitrage you mentioned is exactly what uh, determines the ceiling. This is arbitrage between uh, producer, the market for producer goods and, uh, and the bonds, you see, and that determines the ceiling. And there is a third arbitrage, which is very important, and that goes back to Adam Smith, but I spell it out. And this is what we are in the process of discussing right now, because I did mention the social circulating capital. This is the flow of the river in this direction. And the uh, other flow of maturing real bills, which is used as uh, means of payments for the semi-finished products as they approach the ultimate uh, consumer. So in other words, there is a market for real bills. That's the bill market. Now, the aggregate of consumer goods or the, 
the immediately consumable goods we are talking about is one market and the bill market is another market and there is an invisible arbitrage going on between the two we are going to talk much more about that I'm just giving you the gist of the idea the physical goods and the real bills financing the motion of those now the retail merchant is the arbitrageur who will sell out his inventory and put the proceed, uh, proceeds not into more consumer goods but into the bill market or vice versa depending on the discount rate and the best way to see it is to see, think something uh, seasonal let's say coal which was very important as fuel heating homes uh, even 50 years ago when I was a child that was the, moon, the main uh, source of fuel in the winter to heat homes now the coal merchant when we go into the winter so say in September he starts building up an inventory of coal by selling real bills from his portfolio that's how he gets the financing and then when the heating season starts he has a huge pile of coal and then it's more profitable for him than being in the paper market so he is selling coal and the season is over he allows his pile of coal shrink and then he ends up with cash but he doesn't like the end of sitting on cash so he wants an income and he can replace his income from coal selling coal by going into the real bill market so the proceeds from selling out the last uh, pound of coal he puts into the bills which means that he would take advantage of those produce those uh, merchants retail merchants whose productivity higher than his there's very little need for coal in the summer so his productivity is very low but there are other merchants retail merchants think of those who are selling uh, flower seeds or gardening equipment or something which you can do in the summer uh, or or boats or whatever and those are in their high season they work with a high productivity so the coal merchants which is very very low productivity in the winter in the summer puts his cash into the bill market buying the bills issued by those who are in their high season you see and this is what is happening and it's not just the seasonal nature but the discount rate could vary for any number of reasons and when it does it will make some retail merchants sub-marginal and they are not in a hopeless situation when they see that their productivity is too low they just sell out merchandise and put the proceeds into the bill market until the wheel turns and they reach a higher productivity again so this is what is going on it's a third type which I I'm very confident that it's as close to the actual situation under the conditions of gold standard when there's a valid bill market and bill trading and the mature bills must mature to gold and so this is a model with the three arbitrage situations which govern the economy under the gold standard ideally I, I'm I'm very very confident that I'm close to the truth and every model you create has 
blemishism, you know, you could criticize it. I'm not denying that. So you can find something wrong with that also. But then you have to come up with a better model. And I, for the life of me, I don't see any improvement. Uh, or, or just minor improvement, say. Okay. I would like to ask you a question yes. about uh, the fact that in modern times now, compared to the century before, or two centuries before, services in modern economies are um, a huge part of economies, and we know that we cannot uh, use real bills with uh, the production of services, because we use real bills only for real goods. So how do services and the amount of services that uh, the economy has in uh, connected with your models now? Well, uh, when you talk about services, immediately labor comes to mind. We are talking about human labor, right? And uh, my answer has to do with the fact that so much of the value of a real bill goes not just to pay for the input every stage, at every stage. The producer of the semi-finished good has to put in some new factors, but also labor. So the value of the real bill so much of it goes to pay wages, and that's very, very important, and I don't think Adam Smith talks about that, but it's important to consider that wages come out of the bill market, and this is very important because what I told you yesterday, and also some people brought it up here, that after World War I, that was a capital mistake to come back into circulation. Now, if you think of it during the 19th century, there was simply no such thing as structural unemployed. Because if there were unemployed people, they, they were those who moved from one place to another looking for a job at the new place. So that takes a little bit of time, so temporarily they are unemployed. But they could soon enough to find um, uh, employment. There was just no such thing as structural unemployment. After World War I, all of a sudden, there was an unemployment problem, and it became ghastly during the Depression. It was armies of unemployed people, and uh, we shudder to think of it, because we are threatened by a similar situation. Now why? why? How all of a sudden start? Well, because the bill market was destroyed by the government, not allowing the real bill circulation to come back. Because if real bills were allowed to circulate, there would have been no such thing as structural unemployment for the following reason. You see, we are producing goods, consumer goods, and it's about 91 days for the process to, to semi-finished good to re become so marketable that it is in the consumer market and people will buy it because high, these are high demand goods. Now, but the workers who work during the, all this journey from through 91 days, from where the solidity starts, you see. Those workers have to be paid and fed for 91 days. They cannot wait until the consumer releases his gold coin. So somebody has to advance the money to pay wages for those people who are producing the consumer goods. Well, who is advancing? It's not the banks, it's not the saver, it's not the government, it is the source of credit 
from consumption. The real bills. The, the bill market is the means of financing wages paid of those workers who work in the consumer goods industry. And if you destroy that bill market, then you have destroyed the source of how these wages can be paid. So the government has to come up with a welfare scheme. Uh, though unemployment insurance, charity, this and that, because there's an army of unemployed people who previously were paid from uh, the bill trading, the bill market, you see? Yeah. The bills, the real bills are very marketable. You can convert them into gold coin in short, on short notice. Uh, so if the employer wants to produce in consumer goods in high demand, he wants to pay uh, the wages, he just sells so much of the real bills from his portfolio, and there you go. Gold coins paid out in wages. Now, I, I don't know if this answers your question. We will talk more about this. Any more questions, comments? No? Okay, okay I think we'll uh, call it a day. A uh, day. Uh, <laughs> and we'll congregate again after lunch at 2.30. Thanks very much. Thank Professor. you.